hey, August 18th is coming. That is a third Sunday. I would defeat that Sunday. I want everyone to prepare your hearts to give. Listen, we've been giving since January, and on that Sunday, we want to make up the difference to complete $50,000. I need you not to stay at home that Sunday. Come out. Believe God. Trust God. Obey God. And let's together defeat debt in this, the year of the Lord's help, our undefeated year. I'll see you then. Let's give. Let's bring glory to his name. And let's see what God does for his house, only to be prophetically done for your house. See you then. Wow, isn't it amazing? Look at how beautiful this place is. I want to congratulate all of us for collectively taking care of what God has blessed us with. Listen, this facility all together, I think the project was 2.4 million. And I'm thankful that today we are a little above a million. Wow, what a reduction. That is because of the down payment. That is because of the payments we made. But more importantly, the R138 initiative that we have championed to be our own. Listen, and we're here again, 2024. The R138 initiative is alive. There are five levels in which you can partner. So there's something for everyone to be a part. Every gift, every level is important. Listen, the first level is the partner level, 250. Then there's the greater partner, 500. Catalyst, 1,000, okay? Greater Catalyst, 2,500. Super Catalyst, 5,000. I want you to find your place. If you have not already, continue to give so we can burn the mortgage on this beautiful place, owing no man nothing but to love them. Help me celebrate these people who have already acted in faith in the year of the Lord's help, claiming victory and defeat over debt. Be blessed. Grace and peace, Cathedral family. I am Gabby Edwards. Trust in God. I am a R138 partner giver. With the Lord's help, debt will be defeated in my house and in God's house. Praise God. Good morning, Freedom family. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Greg Cole, CFO of Freedom Rock Cathedral. We just reached the halfway point of 2024, which we proclaim as the undefeated year and the year of the Lord's help. Our numbers for this year are slightly below where we thought they'd be at the halfway point. Now we know that the potential is here, but to be truthfully honest with you, there's a very small percentage of our body that ties faithfully. To those of you who do ties faithfully, we are so grateful and we thank you so much. For others, just want to encourage you, not admonish you. Ecclesiastes chapter five, verses four through five amplifies says, if you vow a vow before God or make a pledge before God, do not hesitate to pay it. For it is better not to make the vow than to make the vow and not to pay it. Now you say, we, maybe you didn't make the vow before God. We vowed before Bishop when he asked us the three questions that we would support the church with our tithes and offering. This is the key to being blessed by God, obedience in our giving and obedience in our living. So let us start now doing better with our giving and with our living. For if we start this, there's no doubt in my mind, God will bless our efforts and we will see the fruit and the manifestation of what God really wants for freedom, for our house and for our families. Thank you, God bless. Grace and peace, freedom, family, and friends. These are your midweek announcements. The IWOC Youth regular schedule will resume in August, which includes youth services on the first and second Sunday, and youth service serving in ministry on third Sunday. IWOC Youth will serve every Wednesday. And we would like to give a huge thank you to all the student volunteers who participated in Love Out Loud. Mark your calendar for Freedom Rocks Rock Community Resource Center. Every third Saturday from 9 until noon, you will have access to food, 
toiletries, life essentials, and so much more. And there is no cost because it's free at Freedom. For August, the third Saturday lands on August 17th, and we look forward to seeing you. Elder Betty Cole is the Outreach Director, and for more information, contact the number or email address on your screen. You can catch Bishop Hedgeman each weekday at 4.50 p.m. on 95.1 FM for a motivational moment with Bishop LeBaron Hedgeman. It's the moment where positive vibes and voice prospers both decisions and the day. So don't miss out on your motivational moment weekdays at 4.50 p.m. on 95.1 FM. If you have a birthday, an anniversary, or you would just like to give someone a shout out, send us your email to office at frcfc.org. And for birthdays and anniversaries, make sure to list the first and last name as well as the date. These have been your midweek announcements and we ask you to keep all announcements in mind and be reminded that Freedom Rock Cathedral is locally committed and globally commissioned. Greetings, beloved. The Bible says that the word of the Lord is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto our pathway. Not only does the word of the Lord give us way, it shows us the way. And I pray that this midweek worship will be one where the word of the Lord will not only give way, give you some options, remove you from being in a perplexed place, but it will show you the way. So get ready to receive illumination by the teachings of the word of the Lord. I'll be right back in just a moment. Father, we thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for being our source of all things. Thank you for being our sustainer. We're yet here because of you, not ourselves. Thank you for being our strengthener, that the only reason we have not fainted is because of you and not ourselves. We thank you for your son, the only true and living God. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit we pray now that the Holy Ghost prepares our hearts now, that, it, that as worship has opened our hearts, may now the Holy Ghost prepare our hearts to receive the Word of God. Father, I pray that in this moment, like your disciples sat with you at the table to eat, to receive. I pray likewise all of us have come to sit at the table to eat and to receive. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we declare, hallelujah, say it with me, my ear is not like the uncircumcised ear. My ear is open to hear and heed the words of the Lord. Amen. Let's go into the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord tonight. So glad to see all of you have come out for midweek worship. Thank you so much. Amen. Fellowship cannot be fellowship without presence. So thank you for your presence. And we pray, amen, that if your week has not gone great, that it will end great. Amen. Amen. All right. So we're going to continue in our series, Praise the Lord, entitled Defeating Foes, Useful Intelligence for Defeating Foes. Let's go to Psalms 108, verse 13, the Passion Translation. Amen. Which is the passage of Scripture that is governing our 2024. Amen. I encourage you to read it. Amen. Even in your own time, you need to rehearse to yourself what God has said to us. Amen. Not just leave it in the atmosphere somewhere, but bring it in your week. Bring it in your evening. Bring it in your nighttime before you go to bed. He says this, with God's help. Everybody say, with God's help. We will prevail with might and power, praise the Lord, and with God's help. Everybody say, God's help. We will trample down our every foe. This is the year of the Lord's help, our undefeated year. Continuing our series, Defeating Foes, Helpful Intelligence for Defeating Foes. You may be seated. Thank you, Lord. So foes again are enemies. Foes represent the opposition. We're stretching our mindset. God is stretching us to no longer define foes by those who have limbs, social security numbers, and skin tone. 
But we also understand that foes, a foe can not only be an individual, but a foe is any form of opposition. It can be the way that we think. It can be the way that we're behaving. It can be the way in which we are seeing. Our perspective can be an opposition against us. And so the reason why God calls this helpful intelligence is because God is causing us to see things that we ordinarily probably would not give attention to until, boom, you know, we've hit a brick wall. And praise God that God loves us so much at freedom that he gives us wisdom before we hit brick walls. I wish I had some help there. Amen. It's up to us if we heed or not. But it's not because we are not aforehand informed, aforehand warned, aforehand um, enlightened. So 2 Timothy 3 and 8, New Living Translation, talks about Jonas and Jambres, how they oppose Moses. And the Bible says these words, that they have depraved minds and a counterfeit faith. Everybody say counterfeit faith. Say it again, a counterfeit faith. All right, so we're going to continue part four tonight, defeating the foe of counterfeit faith. Too superstitious. So I want to finish what we started Sunday. Defeating the foe of counterfeit faith, being too superstitious. This is not the first time. This is not just a subject that you're hearing. It's in the Bible. This is not nothing new to us. Paul stands in the book of Acts, and he began to, on Mars Hill, declare to people that you are too superstitious. Let's see it. Acts 17, verse 22. King James says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill, and he said, Ye men of Athens, I discern that in all things ye are what? He said, you're what? Too superstitious. Let's pick up what we left off Sunday. Let's go to Numbers chapter 23. Let's look at verse number 8 through 9. Numbers chapter 23. Let's look at verse number 8 through 9. He says, how shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? And how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defiled? Here we see again where there's the desire to bring a curse upon people. But he says here, the prophet says to the king, I can't curse who God hadn't cursed. I can't curse who God hadn't blessed. I cannot defy whom the Lord has not defied. And we understand that that's what the blood of Jesus does for us. The blood of Jesus covers our life, covers our future, covers our truth, covers our heart, amen, covers our life in a way where those that even desire to curse us cannot. When you are far too superstitious, you have shared faith. I need somebody to write that down, shared faith, shared faith, shared faith. The Bible says, and I believe it is in Mark chapter 11, verse number 22, have faith faith in God. Say that with me. Have faith in God. One more time. Have faith in God. When you study, they're talking about having the faith of God. So we understand that you can have faith in other things. Yeah, it's people that have faith, but that don't necessarily mean they have faith in God. And what I'm going to expose to you tonight is that when we are far too superstitious, we have faith in God and faith in other things. And some of these other things we have faith in contradict our faith in God. For example, there are people that actually believe that witches have power to curse you. You have faith that in, in, the, in the witch's power. Now, you don't want to tell people that. Because it's going to expose you where, you where you really are. But deep in your heart, you got faith in the witch's power. Well, that contradicts having faith in God. Because if I have the faith of God, I understand that my faith in God won't allow the witch's power to have power or influence over me. But when you have shared faith, you got faith in a whole lot of stuff. And that's what makes us superstitious. Nothing, my God, should share the faith, our, should share our faith uh, 
that we have with God. N nothing should be shared there. That position only belongs to God. We shouldn't believe in God and equally other things. Believe in God and equally other people. Believe in God and equally other traditions. Are you listening to me? God alone sits in a seat by himself. And if you're going to be free from this superstition and get delivered from living with this religious counterfeit faith, you've got to understand that when it comes to faith, you can have faith in other things. But the Bible tells us to have faith in God. Everybody say, I must have faith in God. Say it again, I must have faith in God. And say, when I have faith in God and other things that contradict God, I have then counterfeit faith. And if you're going to walk in victory, you've got to defeat the foe of counterfeit faith. You can't believe in the man and woman of God and in the witch. Man of God said you're healed. Witch say you're sick and you're about to die. I believe both counterfeit faith. How long are you going to halt between two opinions? Are you going to believe God or are you going to believe Baal? Counterfeit faith. Praise the Lord. And in this hour, we got to quit hiding behind that stuff. And again, that real faith in God is developed from walking through trials to completion. Praise the Lord. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And when you finish, you won't want anything. But faith has got to be tried. We got to quit taking exits, saints of God. Hey Amen. We got to be strong. You, you don't want to just say you're stronger because you've been through stuff in life. You want to say you're stronger in the Lord. Hey Amen. You're stronger than you were five years ago. Praise the Lord. In the Lord. Hallelujah. And so we must deal with this counterfeit faith. There are some subtle ways we practice superstitions. Subtle ways we practice superstition. Subtle ways. I mean, these are not ways that are just going to... Uh, jump out at you, but, 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 but you're, you're getting ready to see that there are several things you might be doing. Some of them you may have done today that's going to help you see that you are superstitious. Mm. Look at your neighbor and say, don't, don't, don't look at me during this part. Say, keep your eyes straight forward. I don't, I don't need, tell them I don't need a cosigner. The Holy Ghost is my convictor. First of all, avoiding certain actions. We practice superstitions, superstition by avoiding certain actions. Things that consist of, but not limited to, avoiding walking on the ladders, not crossing paths with black cats, or refraining from, operate, from opening umbrellas under ceilings. Don't let that umbrella up. I'm going to have a bad look. You're practicing superstition. Did you hear me? Avoiding certain actions. Number two, seeking good luck charms. Seeking good luck charms. Carrying items believed to bring you good luck, such as horseshoes, four leaf clovers, lucky coins. Things that are rabbit foots, all this kind of stuff. That's superstition. You believe because of an item you're carrying with you that misfortune won't find you and only fortune will be with you. That's, that's superstition, saints. People of faith don't believe in that. If you don't have nothing in your pocket, are you listening to me? God is with you. Oh, come on, talk to me. What you going to do when you left your rabbit foot at home? But, but you're 30 miles away from home, and you can't go back and get it and be at work on time. So what does that, that mean? Bad day? That's superstitious. Number three, performing rituals. Performing rituals. If, you're, if you practice performing rituals, you are superstitious. What do you mean by performing rituals? Engaging in specific behaviors. Believe to ward off bad luck or attract good fortune. Doing certain things to keep bad luck off and keep good fortune towards you, like tossing salt over your shoulder. 
Oh, I know you don't do that one, but you do this one. You do this one. Oh, praise God. I ain't, I ain't sick, but I, praise God. I'm feeling good today. Yeah, knocking on wood. That is a performed superstitious ritual. You knocking on that wood is not continuing your fortune. It is the presence of God, it is the will of God, and your human intelligence. Yeah, you can knock on that wood, but if you keep practicing human error, right? You're going to get sick. You're going to see some misfortune, right? You don't put all in your car, it's going to kill the motor. I don't care how much you knock on the wood. So some of it is the Spirit of God, some of it is wisdom, human intelligence, all right? But you got to understand these rituals, when you're knocking on the wood in the name of keeping something going in your life, you're practicing superstition. And how many of you, watch this, how many of you know people who have said that Christ has entered in their life and that they've been born again and you've seen Christians knock on wood? Raise your hand. You've seen a believer knock on wood. Look at there. Look at there. That's super. Do you know that's an insult to God? That's an insult to God. Number four, the belief in omens. O-M-E-N-S, omens. The belief in omens is a form of being superstitious. What are omens? It's when you interpret certain events, hear this, or occurrences. We need to hear this. As signs that represent either good or bad. Again, when you interpret certain events or certain occurrences like they are a sign of something good or something bad. Certain occurrences. You got to be careful with that, man. That's not spirit. You don't have to. The Lord will let you know when something good is. The Holy Ghost, that's who's here in the earth with us. Pneumatology. We talked about that Sunday. You know more about demonology than pneumatology. The Holy Ghost goes along with us. He's your helper. He's your guide. He's your advocate. Amen. He's your, he's your teacher. He's all of that for you. He's left in the earth to walk alongside you. Like the disciples walk with Jesus, the Holy Ghost walk with us. You ain't got to worry about no oh, surprisingly evil coming. He's there. He knows the, the future. He shows us things to come. And a lot of times we're so superstitious because we don't have a relationship and a walk with the Holy Ghost. And so somebody got to fill that spot. Whether, whether a believer who's walking with the Holy Spirit, who's communing with the Holy Spirit every day, they're conversing with the Holy Spirit. The believer who has no relationship with the Holy Spirit got to fill that spot. And so you begin to overcome this by communing with the Holy Spirit. You should say in the morning, good morning, Holy Spirit, when you wake up in the morning. Throughout your day, you say, thank you, Holy Spirit. When something comes back in your memory, you forgot, you didn't know what something was, and you was able to go right to it, you should say, thank you, Holy Spirit. You know, oh, something, oh, something told me. Quit that. Stop it tonight, right now. No more. Those, these are the things that help you build fellowship with the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is not just somebody that quivers. No, the Holy Ghost is, is the intelligence we need. The fruit of the Spirit, that's intelligence. Temperance, joy, meekness, that's intelligence. Long-suffering, that's intelligence. So the Holy Ghost is not just somebody that makes us run around the church. He gives us intelligence. He gives us insightfulness. And saints of God, when you have the Holy Ghost, you ain't got to worry about interpreting in your own understanding, which most of the time is rooted in a past experience that has not been addressed. Occurrences as though they're bad luck or something. For example, how do you, how do you believe in omens? Oh, you're sitting there at the house, and y'all sitting around, you visiting somebody, and y'all, you in the dining room enjoying yourself, and then they say, oh, yeah. And they say, man, you know, I didn't get through cleaning up. Here they come through with a broom, and they sweep your foot. Don't sweep my foot. You know about bad luck to me. Don't sweep my foot. Oh, see, 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 I wasn't feeling right. I wasn't feeling right before I went over there. And now when I went over there, they sweep my feet. See, I'm, I'm interpreting that in currents like something bad is about to happen. That's superstition. I'll never forget a little boy. My great-grandfather, Ray Irby, I made a mistake and swept his foot at my grandmom's house. Tuscaloosa. He spit on the bottom of the broom. He said, you got to spit on the broom to cancel that bad luck. 
I still remember that. But that's superstition. Something happened in the current. You almost got ran off the road because somebody else was looking at their phone. And then you say, oh, yeah, no, no. Oh, yeah, see, that's, that's, that, that, that's an attack coming to me. I'm in a season. No, somebody just wasn't paying attention. And they caught themselves in enough time, and you avoided them. That don't mean all this bad luck is getting ready to come to you. And see, we get in all this anxiety, we get in all this foolishness. You're supposed to be in a season of joy, a season of expectation. The word just went for a Sunday while you was at church that you're seeing good days, but your superstition, because you have shared faith, has now counseled what God has said. And because you incurred something throughout the day, you raised that above what God said to you. Saints, that's superstition. Number five, wearing certain colors is the subtle way in which we practice being superstitious. Uh, certain colors, yeah, you know. Go to a funeral home, you got to wear black. Do you know the whole, I, the real history in wearing black to funerals was to show that you were sorrowful and grieving with the family? It had nothing to do with the person that has died. It is your way of showing I'm in mourning with the family. We wear black to funerals because somebody's died. There's nothing in Scripture that connects a believer's death with blackness. The black horse, even in Revelation, represented a curse. Believer's color is always associated with white. Victory. No more mortality. No more sin. No more defeat. White. Jesus reappeared after resurrection in white. Are you listening to me? The angels in white. All right? Our robes mentioned were in Bible are white. But we wear black to an event. You were practicing superstition. Oh, it's in order. Now, the color black in an in, in a occasional term, which is usually events, uh, political moments, Things of that sort, black is always considered a professional color. But we, we, we've adopted this, that you only wear black to funerals, but we don't understand even why we're doing it. So if your heart is there with that family who's now the bereaved, yes. But there's no rule that you should also wear black to funerals. And when we do that, we're practicing superstition. Yeah, wearing certain colors. Oh, if I wear this color, uh, a door going to open for me. It has nothing to do with the color. Nobody's going to fire you because you had on purple instead of pink. And ain't nobody going to marry you because you had on blue instead of green. Are you following me? Okay? And so that's one of the ways we practice. Let's move on. Number six, avoiding taboos. Avoiding taboos. Observing cultural taboos is a form of superstition. For example, making sure that you don't step on a crack on a sidewalk. That's superstition. I've literally seen people, oh, don't split that pole. Uh, they about to run you out in the street, get ran over. Trying not to split a pole. Uh, 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 you about to get flattened. It don't matter what side of the pole you walk on, saints. The blessing of the Lord is on your life. You mean to tell me a side of a pole can undo what Jesus finished? Quit raising your hand in church and shouting and stuff and holding on to this stuff. You got your faith is not real. Your faith is fake. You got a knockoff faith. Your V is in front of the L. It's not Baton Louis. That's a knockoff. And you got a knockoff faith. It don't matter who goes on one side of no pole. Number seven, consulting mediums and psychics is a form of superstition. Seeking guidance, predictions about the future from individuals believed to have supernatural abilities is superstition. Today, the church then fell in that same category. When we study the word of God, really the prophets came to issue warnings. Because the, the other messengers were already communicating blessings. And it was the people who would not hear the conditions of the blessing. That before God allowed the enemy to wipe them out of the earth, 
or pump, bring damnation to their life as a result of their rebellion, the prophet will come to send the warning. But we want the prophet to give us the lottery numbers. Superstition. In the way of the prophet. Okay, get back, get back. I'm trying to get in this view. Move your head. Oh, it's a prophet in town, you know. And, and honestly, it's superstition. We want predictions. Saints of God, that's superstition. Let's go to Leviticus 19. I want to dwell on here a little bit about mediums and psychics, and I want to expose this even more. Because for the church, this is really where we, outside of those practice things, stepping on the crack. So don't nobody else worry about stepping on a crack again. Don't nobody worry about splitting a pole again. Are you listening to me? Don't nobody worry about if a broom sweep over your foot. I don't care what your grandmama said. She didn't know no better. It's okay to let an umbrella up in the house, all right? Quit acting like you don't know no better. Ain't nothing wrong with that. The umbrella went up. Okay. It's okay. Jesus. Mm. Look what he says, Leviticus 19 and 31. Hallelujah. Help us, Lord. Somebody say, help us, Lord. Come on, say it again. Help us, Lord. Leviticus 19 and 31 says, do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists, for you will be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists. What is a spiritist? You want to write this down. Because we have a lot of people in church, a lot of people who have heard the message of the kingdom, and they still give power to spiritists. Spiritists, Elder Key, came from, are those who believe in what is called spiritism. Spiritism. Which actually has been researched to stem from Latin America and the Caribbeans. Hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Spiritism. Watch this. Spiritism says, or should we say, spiritism's belief, listen at this, is that spirits, with a lowercase s, can affect another's health and luck. That spirits can affect your health and spirits can affect your luck. That, 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 that's what spiritism says now these spirits adding to your understanding these spirits affect others health and affect others luck but these spirits are enacted number one by being spoken so so spiritists are people who believe you can speak towards someone's life and affect their health and affect their luck is spoken. Number two, it's wished that if I just desire that Elder Cole dries up to nothing but bone, spiritism says my desire of that, that it can happen. Regardless of who he is in God, but because I desire that he be cursed and dried up to the bone, that it can happen. That's what spiritism says. So it's spoken, it's wished, and then, by, then, then by, con by contact, by touch, that these spirits can affect your health and these sp spirits can affect your luck. So they can speak it on me and it can happen. They can wish it for me and it can happen. Or if they just make contact with me. Now, do you know that there are a lot of people in church today that believe in spiritism. You let somebody come in this church now and they looking like they're a little wild and a little whatever, you'll be closing up your purse, sliding down a seat. Oh, wrapping your child up like a, like a burrito. I don't want nothing to get on them. You know, because you believe in that. Or if they told you somebody wished something on you, then you are staying in the bed for three days. Because you heard somebody has wished that you die by Tuesday. And people actually believe that stuff. And the, that's called spirit, that's, that's a spiritist. So watch this. Here's where we must be. 
We must know that spiritists exist, but we don't believe in them or their power. In this realm, this is where superstitions, superstitions and being superstitious becomes a fault for the believer. Because whatever you believe in, you give power to. What did I just say? Whatever you, you, one more time, whatever you, you give. So the spiritists could have not had any power in your life. But the moment you started to believe that people can wish misfortune on you, you then gave power to spiritism in your life. And so what happens is, let me tell you how we got here. Can I tell you how we got here? We've allowed people who have witnessed this, we've allowed their truth to become our truth. So because your auntie said that she worked with a lady that they said practiced witchcraft and, and because she just kept staring at your auntie every morning when she came in and now your auntie right eye is blurry and she can't see out of it. Your auntie is saying that co-worker wished lost sight in her right eye. And because you loved your auntie, you allowed your emotions, your natural emotions, to embrace her truth as your truth. When the real question should be, is auntie covered? Is auntie saved? Is auntie spirit filled? Is auntie speaking the word? Is auntie obeying God? Because auntie's lack of walk in the word is what caused what the enemy desired to come to pass. The woman that stared at everybody in the darn company. It ain't the stare. But when you believed in the stare, you gave power to it. God, help me right through here. Glory to God. And we saying stupid, foolish stuff in the hearing of our kids and all this kind of stuff. You heard all this bad doctrine and bad teaching. It's spiritist. It's spiritism. And when your mind has been renewed to faith, when you understand the Holy Ghost, when you understand atonement, spiritism can't, has no right. Nobody can wish bad luck upon you. Do you know how many people really wish you would be? You know how many, do you know how many times people have wished ill will toward you? Whatever number you came up with is not enough. It's people who you think love you that has wished ill will towards you. And it's people who loved you now, who hadn't loved you always, who once wished ill will towards you. So the wishing of it doesn't mean that it, it, it's true. People are going to continue to do that, but you shouldn't be shaken by that. What did I just say? What did I just say? That shouldn't affect your mood. That shouldn't affect your personality. You shouldn't be sad at noon because somebody has wished some ill will towards you or somebody posted something about you or somebody told you that somebody said something about you and they took it down. You shouldn't be bothered by that. Praise the Lord because whatever you believe in, you give what to? You give power to. So what makes us believe this kind of stuff is because, again, uh, we, 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 we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't allow the Holy Ghost to counsel us. Spiritism says they can bring bad health and bad luck to you by speaking it, wishing it, or by contact. And we say, what happened to the sons of Sceva? The Bible said that the demons jumped on the sons of Sceva. Sons of Sceva weren't saved. When you studied it out, the sons of Sceva weren't saved. Though their father was a priest in the temple of the law, they weren't saved. James 2 and 19 says even demons believe in God. Those demons didn't even recognize the God in them. Why? Because God wasn't in them. And well before then, Jesus says, I give you power. He says, listen, uh, don't, don't be rejoicing because uh, demons are subject to you. Rejoice because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. So watch this. Because you are born again, demons are subject to you. Catch the revelation. Don't be rejoicing because you said in the name of Jesus and the demon took off. Rejoice because your name is written. Because if your name wasn't written, those demons wouldn't move. Ah. So the demons did not respect them. Instead, the demons retaliated and whooped them because there was no God in them. So we can't use the sons of Sceva as a means why we should be afraid and understand that, oh, that demon's so powerful now. Oh, got them demons powerful now. That demon, that devil will jump on you now. Not a believer? Born again? 
spirit filled, walking out the word, scared of demons? No. Know the condition of such things. Even when things happen to other people, know the condition. Oh, when my ex told me that in two years I was going to have cancer. When we walked out of that divorce room, and in two years I had it, but y'all believe in all that God stuff. Well, uh, did, you, did, you, did you have unforgiveness in your heart concerning the marriage? Well, that's why the devil was able to do that, because unforgiveness opened the door. Your ex ain't got no speaking power. The unforgiveness of your heart gave the devil power in your life. Are you listening to me? What happens, we allow... For the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. He ain't just going around chewing up folk. He has to have permission. So we don't need to give him the kind of power where he doesn't have any legislation. He doesn't have any rules to follow. He doesn't have any orders to adhere to. He just go around and just wipe folk out. He just, somebody wants you dead, devil just come kill you. Not for the believer. Let's work some more. All right? So, let's look at this useful intelligence. This is what we must do tonight. We must exchange fear and control. That's what we need to give up tonight. We need to exchange. Give up fear and give up the need for control. Hear this. For covering and confidence. I want you to write that down. We need to exchange fear and control for covering and confidence okay many of us we're superstitious because we really have a struggle with fear mm -hmm. and others of us we're superstitious because we have an overly obsession with the need for control but really we should give those things up so that we can be covered by God and then we can be confident in his covering. Are you with me? When you're confident in his covering, in his sovereignty, you understand you ain't got to be in control. Because I and you can only control what we see and what we know. Well, I have too much in my life that I can't see. And there's too much going on every day that I don't know. So do you want your own covering or do you want his? Well, you can't be covered by God and in control. Are you listening? His covering requires the vulnerability and the exchange for control. Humble yourselves under, under, under the mighty hand of God. The prideful can't come under. So when you give up control, you take on a level of humility that brings you under his covering. Are you listening? Genesis chapter 12, I'm just going to quote it, write it down, one through three. He tells Abraham, get from your kindred, from your father's house. He says all these things I'm going to do. I'm going to make your name great. But he goes on to say, he says, I'm going to bless them that bless you. And I'm going to curse them that, that curse you. Many people are superstitious because like them with the spirit is, they believe that they can be cursed by others. There's a lot of people today watching me right now that believe they can be cursed by others. When you look at the word curse, one of the, one of the derivatives of it in Scripture means to swear falsely. Exodus 20 and 7, whenever we swear falsely to God, we bring about a curse to ourselves. That's why we don't never supposed to swear to God and swear falsely or swear on God's behalf to others. You better watch that stuff, I promise to God, on God, you better be careful. You're bringing a curse on God, knowing you lying. Just say, I don't want to answer that right now. Better quit all that on God. You're swearing falsely. Did you hear me? I ain't hear you. I promise to God, knowing you heard them. Lord, cover us in the blood in every aspect that we have sworn falsely. Your hand should have been up. I'm trying to give you some more life. I'm, that might add 10 more years to your life. Yes, God. We curse also. Number two, is the, it means to use profanity. That's Colossians 3 and 8, to speak foul language. That's curse, profanity. But the third way in which curse comes about is what is called word curse. Romans 12 and 14 says, bless them, don't curse them. So this idea of word curse, and a lot of stuff we call cussing 
really in its true intent when you study it out is word cursing bringing a curse upon others by use of words okay and so we must understand word cursing is one of the ways that people put curses on people in revelation what he says that i'm gonna curse everybody that curse you that abrahamic blessing and there are people who live today with still respect to that but that's old covenant i need you to write this down no one can curse me I said, I need you to write that down. No one can curse me. Say it, say it out loud. Come on, say it again. Say it till you believe it. Say it like you're trying to convince somebody. Say it so they can hear you on Fifth Street. That's much better. No one can curse you. Galatians 3 and 13. See, a lot of this superstitious stuff will be, it will flee from you when you get your, your faith back where it needs to be. See, you got, in some areas of your life, you, you've had counterfeit faith. Glory to God. Thank God for, for teaching. Thank God for correction. Thank God for admonishment. Because any areas where you've had counterfeit faith, you've been given You've been giving room to the enemy. He's had square footage to work in your life, to work in your money, to work in your mind, to work in your future. But praise God, we're taking our square footage away. We're taking it back. Hallelujah. Everybody say, I'm taking my power back. I've given power in places where they should not have been. But tonight, I'm taking my power back. Glory to his name. Christ purchased our freedom redeeming us from the curse doom of the law and the condemnation by himself becoming a curse for us for it is written that everyone that hangs on a tree that is crucified is cursed Jesus redeemed us purchased our freedom being made a curse for us so when Jesus purchased your freedom you've got to understand he did that by blood his blood at the same time he was becoming a curse he was undoing a curse the same time he was becoming a curse he was undoing every curse that had a right in my life from that day till the end. He finished the law's permission to allow another man to curse another man. Jesus. Hallelujah. By one man sin entered into, by another man, the Bible says we were all justified. Can't nobody curse you because at the cross of Calvary, the blood atoned you. Which then allowed Christ to put on your curse so you can put on his blessing. Go to Titus 2 and 14. Jesus, I got to hurry up. Titus 2 and 14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people jealous of good works. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. See, the law said as long as you were doing perfect, as long as you did everything you were supposed to do, you good. But the law said you got out of line in one spot. Now everything that iniquity brought about could now be brought into your life. When Jesus redeemed you, he redeemed us by his blood, it atoned us from all iniquity. Thank you, Lord. So now, when you would mess up under the law, curses that people desire for you, boom. They, they all at once. It's over with. Now that Christ has died for you and the blood has atoned you, when you do step out of line, his blood is there. Not your wrong. His blood is there. His blood redeemed you from all of your own. So now nobody can curse you because you've been redeemed. I need you to hear this. Write this down. His blood. I think I'm going to stop here. 
I may have to come and teach this some other time. All right. His blood. Thank you, Lord. Whose blood? Okay. Write it down. Atonement. Write by that atonement. His blood atonement. Mm -hmm. Makes me. You, you, that's your notes. Me. You're talking about yourself. His blood atonement makes me undeserving of the curse. Read back to me what you just wrote down. Now that might take you two weeks for that to really sit down on you. So now, you're not deserving of the curse because of something you've done, something you're doing, or something you will do. Because his blood made you now undeserving of the curse you don't deserve that because of his blood see superstition best friend is religion because religion struggles with revelation religion say, ain't no way no i gotta do something no it's because i'm right no it's because of what i did it's because i ain't never missed a day of school it's because i ain't never did it religion wants to earn redemption but even at your best it wasn't good enough but because of his blood, he's redeemed us. And because of his blood, he now makes us undeserving of the, cross, of the curse. Remember we said uh, the blood atonement, it reconciles us, restores us to innocence. Atonement, his blood says he's, he's forgiven us completely and forever for our sins. Everybody say, I'm undeserving. Now, you need to take this with you when you leave. I'm going to take my exit here. I have so much more to share about Psalms 91. You'll see covering and confidence. But we, we, we're confident in this covering. Because of our covering, no evil will befall us. It don't mean that evil, one will fall by a thousand by one side, ten thousand by the other side. He didn't give you an exemption. You are right there where people are falling. He didn't give you exemption. He gave you covering. But he said, none will come nigh you. See, as you, as you grow in the word, if you understand, giving up fear giving up a need for control, and embracing his covering and confidence in that covering, now the Bible will make sense for you. So when you get home, read Psalms 91, and you're going to see where covering gives us confidence. And then read Psalms 27, and you'll see where covering and confidence. Yeah, but I want to close here at this one, last scripture. It's Proverbs 26 and 2. Let this bless you. Now I'm telling you. Jeez, I had to stand up on my seat when I was studying and came across this. New Living Translation. I want you to read it. What does it say? <laughs> you still don't get it. Let the Lord have mercy. Help us. When you have been made by God undeserving of the curse. The Bible says they can have you cornered, spot on, accurate as a scope, but God won't let it land. I'm done, standing all over the building. I'm not gonna shout by myself tonight. I promise you, I'll go there. Let that bless you. God, thank you for the word we've heard tonight. May our life forever be changed by the revelation of the scripture. God, may we be free from superstition. God, may we understand that we are not spiritists and neither do we believe in spiritists because we understand that your blood has atoned us, restored us to innocence. Your blood has made it where no devil or man can curse us. Your blood has made us what we call undeserving of the curse. And God, we thank you that just like an arrow is shot out, because we are undeserving of the curse, you will not allow it to land where it was intended. So God, we understand that we are centered in the, in, we are centered in the intentions of many foes, of many enemies, of many devils and demons, of many principalities and powers. We are centered in the intentions of many witches and warlocks, many spiritists, charmers. But we thank you, Lord. We got a word 
You said you won't allow it to land where they have intended it. We thank you for covering. And we thank you tonight that you've given us the necessary tools and intelligence to defeat the foe of counterfeit faith. May we no longer have shared faith, but may we have the Mark 11 and 22. May we have faith in God. In God. Not in other things. God, free us tonight. Don't allow us to be in doom. Don't allow us to be misled by people who sound spiritual. But tonight I thank you, God, that illumination brings light to your people. Yeah, 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 yeah. For the Lord is our light and our salvation. Of whom shall we fear and of whom shall we be afraid? When our enemies and even our foes come to eat of our flesh, they will stumble and fall. Though a host shall encamp around us, one thing that this shall we shall be comforted. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. One shall fall by our right side. Two and ten by our left side, but none shall come nigh us. May this word comfort our hearts. And may this word be our go-to in the next season where we sense attack and doom. In the next season where we're sensing anxiety and satanic suggestions. We won't allow that stuff to run our run and ruin our mood, our personality, our week, our nights, our rest. But instead, we will revisit these notes. We will revisit this message. And we will find in the scriptures the comfort in knowing that we're covered. And no man can curse us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you was blessed, give God praise. Will God be praised prayerfully something that was dark or something that was dim now has been enlightened by the truth of God's word. I pray that you take the notes that you've received, you apply them to your life. And I believe that God will cause what he has promised from the word of the Lord to show up for you. He's no respecter of persons. If he did it for one, he'll do it for you. Continue to tune in. We'll see you next time. You be blessed.